Hi guys, it's me, Professor D, and welcome back to my YouTube channel. On this video, I'm going to be covering the patient with respiratory issues and how to care for them. Now, before we get started, as always, I'm going to ask you to please support me and support this channel by liking this video, pressing the red notification bell so you'll be notified every single time a new video is released, and also subscribing to my channel if you haven't done so already. Please don't forget, I'm now offering next generation NCLEX reviews, one-on-one -on -one consultation sessions, and tutoring sessions. You can reserve your spot right now by going to my website, nexusnursinginstitute.com, and while you're there, be sure to check out the audio lessons that I I have available. Before we get started, one more thing I want to cover with you. Um, I like to pray at the beginning of my videos and I believe in free will. So if you're not into that, go ahead and just fast forward. If you are, as always, please close your eyes, bow your head, unless you're operating heavy machinery, keep your eyes open. Thank you, Father God. Thank you, Lord, for this wonderful Mother's Day that you have allowed me to have with my family and my husband and my children and my mother. Thank you, Lord, for all the mothers that are in my life that have supported me and everything that I do. Thank you for them, Father God. Thank you for all of the mothers who are watching or listening right now. And they may not be biological mothers, but they may be mother figures for someone else. Thank you for them, Father God. Thank you for every single listener and viewer at this moment. Lord, I ask that you please bless them abundantly. As we're going through this information, Father God, Lord, I ask that you please help me to explain this way uh, this information in a way that is palatable to the listener or viewer. Help them to understand it. Help them to be able to think critically through this information so that when they see the same concepts again, Father God, they can answer the question correctly and appropriately. Thank you for all that you've done and you'll, and you'll continue to do for us in Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. All right, guys, uh, before we get started, happy Mother's Day to everyone that is out there. Happy Mother's Day. Okay, let's get started. First question. Mr. W is an 83-year-old man who was brought to the hospital from a long-term care facility by emergency medical services after reporting severe dyspnea and shortness of breath. He's been experiencing cold-like symptoms for the past two days. He has a productive cough with thick yellowish sputum. When Mr. W awoke in the nursing home, it was found that he was having difficulty breathing even after using his albuterol meter dose inhaler. He appears very anxious and is in respiratory distress. His history includes COPD related to smoking two packs of cigarettes per day since he was 15 years old. He quit smoking two years ago when he was admitted to the long-term care facility. Mr. W has incontinence of urine and stool for the past two years. In the emergency department, Mr. W undergoes chest radiography and admission laboratory tests are performed, including serum electrolyte levels and complete blood count. A sputum sample is sent to the lab for culture and sensitivity testing and gram staining. Mr. W's vital signs values are as follows. The blood pressure is 154 over 92, heart rate 118, O2 sat 88% on one liter, respiratory rate 38 breaths per minute, and the temperature is 100.9. First question. Which priority actions will the nurse take when the patient's initially admitted to the emergency department? Select all that apply. All right, guys, how do we treat select all that apply? We treat them as true or false. Let's go. One, place the patient on a cardiac monitor. True. If you go back to this patient's vital signs, that heart rate is 118. A normal heart rate is supposed to be, what, 60 to 100. So we're concerned about this patient and dysrhythmia. So absolutely, we're going to have them on a heart monitor. Two, get a baseline set of vital signs. Of course, every time you have a new admission, one of the first things you're going to do is get a baseline because we want to see how you're, how the patient's trending, right? We want to see how they came in and what's happening. Are they getting better? Are they getting worse? We need to know how they're trending. Three, draw admission labs and place a saline lock. Of course. And the fact that, you know, this is an option, you have to think to yourself that it's been ordered. Now you have to question yourself, is it appropriate? Am I going to do it or not? And of course we're going to do it. We wanted to get um, the labs as a baseline. Again, we want to see how that patient's trending and we're going to have that lock in place. We have to give the patient IV fluids or medications. Um, four, change the patient's adult pad. 
false. That is something that you can delegate. You can delegate that to an unlicensed assistive personnel. That's number one. And number two, that's not a priority. Whenever you get test question about a priority, you need to be thinking Maslow's hierarchy of needs, what physically keeps your patient alive the longest. And uh, five, send the patient for a chest x-ray. Absolutely. Why are we doing that? And of course, if it says send the patient for a chest x-ray as ordered, because it's a choice, we know it's been ordered. The question is, are we going to do it or not? Yes, we're going to do it. We need to see what's going on with the patient. Do they have pneumonia? Do they have bronchitis? Is there something else going on with this patient? Because we see they've got this respiratory um, history. We want to see what's going on with them. So yes, we'll do that. And choice six, order the patient a lunch tray. False. We can do that down the road, but this patient just came in. We need to get baselines. We need to find out what's going on with them. Getting them lunch is not going to be a priority. Again, when you get a question about priority, I want you to think of these three things. I want you to think of Maslow's hierarchy of needs and to be specific, physiological integrity, what's keeping that patient alive. You know, vital signs, glucose, nutrition, um, um, hemodynamic status, stuff like that. I want you to think of ADPI, Assessment, Diagnosis, Planning, Intervention, Evaluation. You always assess your patient first. And I want you to think of ABCs, Airway, Breathing, Circulation. Whenever you're asked about priorities, really they're asking you about one of those three things. Usually it's a physiological integrity, but it might be one of the other two, okay? But I want that to be in the back of your mind as you're answering these questions. Next question. What is the priority nursing concern for this patient? One, skin care due to incontinence. Two, clearance of thick secretions. Three, rapid heart rate. Or four, elevated temperature. And guys, the correct answer is two, clearance of thick secretions. Now, again, this question is asking us what our priority is. I think it was very easy for you to get rid of number one. Incontinence, that really never killed anyone. And if it didn't, didn't kill them quickly, right? So we're able to get rid of that. So you're down to them clearing their secretions, the rapid heart rate, and the elevated temperature. You have to say to yourself, out of these three situations, what will kill my patient the fastest? And it's going to be number two, those thick secretions. Why? Why thick secretions? Those thick secretions are blocking what? Airway. You can't live without breathing. But guess what? You can live with that, you know, rapid heart rate. The heart rate is 118. We want it to be 60 to 100. It's slightly elevated. We don't want it at 118, but that 118 heart rate isn't going to kill you as fast as not being able to breathe well. Look at the elevated temperature. The temperature is 100.9. That is elevated, but what's going to kill you faster? That elevated temperature or the occlusion of airway because of those thick secretions, the occlusion of airway. You cannot live without breathing. So that's why number two is the correct answer choice. Okay, next question. So I'm going to give you guys a situation first. Patient had a rapid response. After the rapid response, the respiratory therapist provides a patient with a handheld nebulizer treatment, and Mr. W is stable enough to be admitted to the acute care unit. Which interventions would the acute care RN delegate to an experienced unlicensed assistive personnel? Select all that apply. How do we treat select all the apply as true or false? What are we going to give to the UAP? Number one, changing the patient's incontinence pad as needed. True. That's within their scope of practice, right? Number two, performing pulse oximetry every shift. True. All they're doing is recording and reporting. Okay, that doesn't require critical thinking. So when we can give that to an unlicensed assistive personnel. Now, with that being said, I'm not saying that unlicensed assistive personnel cannot think critically. No, what I'm saying is when you're trying to decide what you're going to give to a licensed nurse versus an unlicensed assistive personnel, ask yourself, does this require critical thinking? And if it does, don't give it to the unlicensed assistive personnel. Just for testing purpose, please don't come for me in the comment section. Okay, I'm trying to help you pass your test. Moving on. Number three, teaching the patient to cough and deep breathe. False. Teaching, that requires what? Critical thinking, right? When you're, do, when you're delegating something to an unlicensed personnel, you cannot delegate anything that involves evaluation, monitoring, assessment, teaching, all of those require critical thinking, okay? So for testing purposes, we're not going to delegate those types of things, so false. Four, reminding the patient to use Inceptus barometer every hour while awake. 
true. That's not teaching. That's reminding. That's the unlicensed assistive personnel saying, Mr. Such and Such, don't forget, your nurse said X, Y, Z. Don't forget, your nurse taught you X, Y, Z. So they're not teaching. They're reminding. They're allowed to remind. Number five, assessing the patient's breath sounds every shift. False. Think about it. Unlicensed assistive personnel, they're allowed to do vital signs because that's recording and reporting. They can take the blood pressure. They can take the heart rate. They can take respirations, but they can't listen to lung sounds because listen to lung sounds, you have to differentiate the difference between clear versus wheezing versus ronchi versus crackles, right? That is your difference. So no on the assessment. And then six, encouraging the patient to drink adequate oral fluids. True. Hey, Mr. Such and Such, remember your, your nurse said you need to drink lots of fluids. Let me help you take a sip. Let me give you a straw. So the correct answer choices here is number one, two, four, and six. Mr. W's emergency department lab values include a serum potassium of 2.8. What's the priority nursing action at this time? One, teach the patient about potassium rich foods. Two, provide the patient with oxygen at two liters per nasal cannula. Three, contact and notify the healthcare uh, in health care provider immediately or for initiate normal saline at 20 milliliters per hour. And I love these answer choices. Look at how they try to trick you. I hope you did not choose uh, to give them oxygen because as students, if you see oxygen, you're running to it, right? Oxygen isn't always the answer just because you see it there. The correct answer is three. You're going to notify the health care um, provider immediately. Potassium 3.5 to 5, that is your therapeutic range. It has a very narrow therapeutic range. Anything outside of that can cause a patient to have dysrhythmias, okay? We are in dangerous territory. The fact that the patient is hypokalemic at 2.8, you better call the healthcare provider. That is the only thing that you can do in this situation. What is giving that patient oxygen going to do? That hypokalemia is gonna cause what? Heart problems, cardiac issues. The patient does, isn't having problems with their oxygen at this moment, not in this clinical picture that's been provided to us. Look at choice number one, teach the patient about prior um, foods that are high in potassium. That is wonderful, but that's not gonna be our priority. We need to fix the situation right now of hypokalemia. We're gonna call the healthcare provider because we expect you know, PO or IV potassium to be ordered. This is not the time to be, let me tell you something. Let me tell you something. Whenever you get a test question about a priority, it's not gonna be teaching, right? A priority is gonna be something that we have to address right now. The only time it's going to be teaching is if all of your choices are teaching, then you have to choose the correct teaching. But when it comes to priority, you know, teaching is on top. Remember Maslow's hierarchy of lists? Everything that's important is on the bottom and least important is on top. Prior teaching is like towards the top when it comes to priority. So we're not going to worry about teaching them. We could teach them about foods high in potassium after we get that current hypokalemia regulated. What other choices were there? Initiate normal saline. Again, the problem right now that we're concerned about is the hypokalemia, and that's what needs to be addressed. So the only thing you can do is call the healthcare provider to get orders. Mr. W is receiving an IV dose of potassium. Good. They're getting IV dose of potassium, 10 milliequivalents, 100 milliliters, normal saline to run over an hour. The UAP asks why it takes so long to infuse such, amount, such a small amount of fluid. So what should the nurse explain to the UAP? The UAP wants to know why it takes so long to deliver such a small amount. What is your answer going to be? Select all that applies. Remember, how do we treat select all that applies? As true or false? Let's go. What? IV potassium is very irritating to the veins and can cause phlebitis. True. Absolutely true. And not only can it cause phlebitis, if it infiltrates, it can kill the surrounding tissue and cause necrosis. True. Two, oh, I gave you an answer, sorry. Two, uh, tissue damage by potassium can cause necro necrotic or necrotic tissue or necrosis. True. Three, oral potassium can cause nausea, so IV potassium is preferred. False. That's false. Why? Go back to the question. What's being asked of us is why it takes so long to infuse. If they're asking us why it takes so long, why would we say that oral potassium can cause nausea, so that's why we're giving IV? 
that doesn't answer why it takes so long. And by the way, oral potassium does cause um, nausea, but if we had a choice, we would give oral because it's safer than giving IV. So that would be false anyway. But the question is, why, are, why is this medication taking so long to infuse? Why aren't we giving it to the patients faster? We don't want to kill the patient. Here in the state of Florida, you know, that's how we kill our inmates, right? With potassium. Potassium can kill a patient very quickly. So three false, four. The maximum recommended infusion rate for IV potassium is five to 10 milliequivalents per hour. That is absolutely true. You cannot give more than 10 milliequivalents per hour. You will put your patient into a dysrhythmia, possibly an arrhythmia and kill your patient. So that's true. Five, that's a good question. I'll ask the healthcare provider if I can give the drug IV push. You just turned into uh, a killer. Yeah. You give, you give potassium IV push, you turn into a killer. You are a murderer, so we're not going to do that. That's false. And six, the goal is to prevent infiltration into the tissue. And that is true because if it infiltrates again, it will literally kill the surrounding tissue. So the correct answer choices here is number one, two, four, and six. During morning rounds, the nurse notes all of these assessment findings for Mr. W, which finding indicates a worsening of his condition? Is it one, barrel-shaped chest, two, club fingers on both hands, three, crackles bilaterally, or four, frequent productive cough? And the only answer choice here, guys, is three, crackles bilaterally. Crackles bilaterally. This is a new finding. The, that crackles that you hear, that's the sound letting you know we now have fluid in the lungs. Is fluid ever supposed to be in the lungs? Absolutely not. And here's how we know it's a worsening condition. If you go back to the beginning when we went over the patient's clinical situation, they didn't have crackles. But number one, barrel-shaped uh, barrel chest, that is a symptom of COPD that the patient has. Number two, club fingers on both hands, that is a symptom of COPD that the patient has. Number four, Frequent productive cough. That patient was admitted with that frequent productive cough. They had that upon admission. What they did not have, what we did not expect them to have is the crackles. And it's bilaterally. So we're getting crackles in both lungs. That lets us know that this patient's condition has worsened. Which assessment finding would the nurse instruct the UAP to report immediately? One, incontinence of urine and stool. Two, a one pound weight loss since admission. Three, patient cough productive of greenish yellowish sputum or for eating only half breakfast at lunch and guys the correct answer is number four why is that a priority that'll kill our patient the fastest look at this uh, a productive cough of what greenish yellowish sputum so not only are they having a productive cough the the what they're coughing up is greenish yellowish what does that let us know infection patients got an infectious process going on okay now, everything else should be addressed, the incontinence of urine and stool. Well, the patient came in with incontinence of your stool. If you go back to the clinical situation, they've been incontinent for, what, two years now? So why is that an emergency? Um, one, the weight loss since admission. We saw in that clinical situation, they haven't been having a good appetite. They have not been eating. We expect them to have weight loss. We don't want them to have weight loss. It's going to be addressed, but it's not going to kill them as fast as that possible pneumonia will, right? Because that messes with their breathing. And then choice four, eating only half breakfast at lunch. That's what they've been doing. They've been had a low, um, small appetite. Now, again, I'm not saying it's not important. It needs to be addressed, but it's not going to kill them as fast as a possible lung infection. And so that's why number three is our correct answer. The UIP checks morning vital signs and immediately reports the following values to the nurse, which takes priority when notifying the healthcare provider. One, heart rate of 96 beats per minute. Two, blood pressure 160 over 90. Three, respiratory rate of 34 breaths per minute. Or four, oral temperature of 103.5. And guys, the correct answer is four. And I know many of you guys were tempted to choose three because <gasps> respiratory airway, you jump to that, right? But this is where your critical thinking has to come in. Go back and look to see what, upon admission, remember how I told you when the patient comes in, we need to get baseline because we have to see how the patient's trending. If you go back, upon admission, the patient's respiratory rate was 38 breaths per minute. 
Now it's down to 34. So even though we're still outside of the normal parameters, we see the respirations going down. We see it getting better. But in four, if you look at the admission, their temperature was 100.9. Now it's 103.5. This one, they're getting worse. That's going to be our priority. Whenever you get a test question about priority, you have to go to patients that's getting worse, not getting better, right? So this is where your critical thinking skills come, can, comes in. Don't just look at the number and say 34 breaths per minute. Oh, that's my answer. Uh-uh. Even though the 34 breaths per minute is not good, we got to look and see how they came in. Is that patient getting better or worse? Because we got to look for the one that's getting worse. And we see that the respirations are going down. So it couldn't be that. Let's go to our other wrong choices. One, heart rate of 96 beats per minute. That's normal. Normal heart rate, 60 to 100. Two, the blood pressure of 160 over 90. Here's the thing with that. The blood pressure 160 over 90, that is slightly elevated from the admission, right? But when you compare that slight elevation of blood pressure to that elevation of temperature, which one to kill the patient faster? That temperature. What are we suspecting? Something's going on. This patient's got an infectious process, most likely pneumonia or another respiratory condition, but that's going to kill the patient much faster than that slight elevation of the blood pressure. Remember when they came in, it was 154 over 92 and now it's 160 over 90. So the temperature will kill them much faster. And that's why number four is the correct answer choice. An LPN tells the RN that the patient's now receiving oxygen two liters uh, per minute via nasal cannula and his pulse ox reading is now 91%, but he still has crackles in the bases of his lungs. What intervention should the RN assign to the LPN? One, begin creating a plan for discharging the patient. Two, administer furosemide 20 milligrams orally each morning. Three, get a baseline weight for the patient now. Or four, administer that antibiotic, you know, I can't pronounce. Um, so, I'm not going to try to pronounce it. You see the antibiotic to give it IV piggyback every six hours. All right, guys, and the correct answer is to administer furosemide 20 milligrams orally um, each morning. That is the only one that you would delegate to the LPN because remember, LPNs, whenever you're delegating to the LPN, you're always going to delegate the most stable patient. You're going to delegate the patient that's going to get the routine meds that have a predictable outcome. Let's go through the wrong answer choices. One, creating a care plan. Can LPNs or LVNs create care plans? No, that is the, the job of the RN. That is uh, their responsibility. Now what the LPN and LVN do, they follow the care plan, but they cannot create the care plan, so that's false. Three, get a baseline weight for the patient now. You can give that, you can delegate that to a UAP to do. Four, administer, let me see if I can pronounce this. Sofoxetine, there we go. Sofoxetine IV piggyback. What is a key word here that made us know we're not gonna give this medication to the LPN, piggyback? LPNs, LVNs do not do piggybacks. They do not do pushes. They do not do central lines. They do not create care plans. They do not do discharges. They do not do admissions. I mean, the list can go on, but the list also can go on on what they're allowed to do. But the point is, because it said, um, not every push, piggyback, we know we're not going to delegate that to the LPN or LVN. The RN has to keep that type of patient. But giving... Furosemide, 20 milligrams by mouth, that is a routine medication. We can delegate that to the LPN, LVN, so that is a correct answer choice. The RN administers the patient's first dose of IV cefotoxin. I hate this. All right, you guys see that medication that I cannot pronounce. It's an antibiotic. So the RN administers an IV and within 15 minutes, Mr. W develops a rash with, with fever and chills. What is gonna be the nurse's first reaction at this time? What is the first thing they're gonna do? Number one, discontinue the IV infusion. Two, administer two tablets of acetaminophen. I can say acetaminophen, but I can't say that antibiotic. Number three, measure the area of the rash or number four, check for numbness and tingling. What do you think the answer is? All right, the correct answer is number one. 
Number one, whenever something is harming or injuring your patient, the very first thing you're going to do is stop it. Patients getting an infusion, if you go back to the question, look what they're getting. Rash, fever, chills. What are other like uh, adverse reactions of this type of antibiotic? Bleeding. You start seeing symptoms of that patient hemorrhaging, bruising, diarrhea. Those are adverse reactions. The first thing you're going to do is stop that medication. Choice number two, three, four, no. Whenever you get a test question and you see the patient's having a negative reaction to something, the first thing you're gonna do is stop whatever is harming your patient. Number one is the correct answer choice. Mr. W's lost 15 pounds over the past year. On admission, he tells the nurse that his appetite is not what it used to be and he becomes short of breath while eating. Which intervention should be including in his nursing care plan? Select all the ply. Again, how do you treat select all the ply as true or false? Let's go. One, initiate a dietary consult. Absolutely. Why? They're losing weight. They have decreased appetite. We need to get a dietary on the, on the case. Okay? By the way, you, the registered nurse, you're the one who's going to call the healthcare provider and say, hey, this is what's going on. Can I get an order for dietary consult? You do not delegate that to the PN or VN. You, the RN, is responsible for calling the healthcare provider to ask for consults, okay? Two, stress that he must eat all of his meals or he'll become malnourished. False. Number one, most likely he's already malnourished, but forget that. Number two, you don't tell a patient that they must do anything. They are not a child. Okay, we're going to treat that patient with dignity and respect. False. Three, monitor serum prealbumin levels. True. Yes. Why? That prealbumin level will give you a great idea of what that patient's uh, nutrition looks like. Okay, it gives you a nutritional status for that patient. True. Four, suggest four to six small meals per day. True. Guess what? I'll give you guys a hint. When it comes to GI, whenever patients having any issues with GI, we're always going to recommend small, frequent meals, especially for the patient that has respiratory issues because the act of eating is work. It requires energy. It requires um, oxygen to the tissues for that patient so they can get very fatigued. So you're going to teach them small, frequent meals. Five, instruct the patient to use a bronchodilator 30 minutes before meals. True. Again, eating for these type of patients, it's work. They're going to need more oxygen. So it's great that they get this type of medication, which will decrease bronchospasms during the time that they need oxygen. They need that energy in order just to eat. Um, choice six, encourage dry foods to avoid coughing. False. If anything, what do dry foods do? They stimulate coughing, not prevent coughing. So um, six is false. The correct answer choice is number one, three, four, and five. Okay, guys, we are down to our last question. The UAP tells the nurse that Mr. W is unable to complete his morning care without assistance and wonders if he's being lazy. What should be the nurse's best response? One, encourage the patient to do as much as he can as quickly as he can. Number two, if the patient is short of breath, increase the oxygen flow. Three, remind the patient to take his time and not to rush his morning care. Or four, he may not need as much help as he's asking for, so try to get him to do more. And the only correct answer choice here is three. Remind the patient to take his time and not to rush his morning care. Think about the disease process of COPD where the patient is not able to fully breathe out. They're holding on to all those, that CO2 and they're walking around in a constant acidic state, right? They're gonna be constantly tired. They're gonna have fatigue. They're gonna have hypoxia. It's gonna take them more time to do things because the more things that they do, it increases their metabolic rate, increases their demand for oxygen. Oxygen, by the way, that they don't have. So we're gonna encourage them to take their time in doing things because we understand how tiring it is. Wrong answer choice is one. Encourage them to do as much as they can. I'm with that so far because we always do that in nursing, but look at the rest as quickly as he can. False. Here's the thing. I don't care how beautiful an answer choice is. 
If the whole thing is not correct, the whole thing is wrong. Because it said quickly, that's false. They cannot rush. Choice two, if the patient is short of breath, increases oxygen flow. First of all, we're not going to tell a, a UAP to do anything with the patient's oxygen. That's number one, right? And number two, is that a good idea to increase the oxygen flow of a COPD patient? Absolutely not. So we're going to throw that out. And then choice number four, he may not need as much help as he's asking for. So try to get him to do, this patient's not lying. With that disease process, again, every time they do an activity, the demand for oxygen increases the oxygen that they don't have. So they get fatigued very easily. They're walking around in a constant state of hypoxia. So the correct answer choice is three. Guys, I hope you found this video to be helpful. Please let me know in the comment section what you thought about this video, what you'd like to see me cover more extensively and the format that you'd like to see me cover. Do you like it like this? Question answer. Do you like it in a Kahoot? Or do you like it in a lecture where I'm teaching out the book? Let me know in the comment section. Don't forget, I'm now offering Next Generation NCLEX reviews. I'm offering one-on-one -on -one tutoring sessions and consultations. And you can reserve your spot right now on my website, nexusnursinginstitute.com. And while you're there, be sure to check out the audio lessons I have available. I'm going to be adding some new ones within the next couple of weeks. So be sure to keep checking if you don't see something that you need particularly at this moment guys thank you so much for watching this video you guys catch me on the next video